And there's this sick idea that, well, you did choose to look so outwardly Jewish, so you didn't have to, which is really, um, again, in the age of uh, inclusivity and diversity is such a sick um, and just yep. wrong perspective. And we need to know that this is out there and we need to push back at it. Folks, as you know, social media censorship is growing. The best way to support our video work for Israel is to subscribe to our video newsletter on pulseofisrael.com and to share our videos. If you are already a subscriber, then thank you. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Pulse of Israel here in our eternal and ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, in our undivided capital, eternal capital, Jerusalem. There is a major issue going on today in the Jewish Orthodox world. If anyone is connected to Netflix and you are on top of the latest programs that Netflix is uh, pushing out there to the public, well, one is a reality TV show called My Unorthodox Life, which basically follows in a reality TV style um, a, a woman and her children that after many years of growing up and living with the Jewish Orthodox lifestyle, um, this mother got divorced and she's now living her life as a uh, away from the Orthodox lifestyle. But unfortunately, instead of just focusing on her wonderful life and her children, uh, it is very much focused on bashing the Orthodox lifestyle that she left. And it is making waves in, uh, in the Jewish community, especially the Orthodox community, especially women in the Orthodox community who are all of a sudden on the defensive of defending themselves, how beautiful their lives are, even with the challenges that Orthodox Judaism brings to the table. Um, beautiful challenges, like all lifestyles. I'm speaking right now with, uh, I'm going to speak with right now with Allison Joseph, who is the director of a nonprofit called Jew in the City. And this is a fabulous organization. I've actually been following Allison for years, probably since she began, on top of these issues, really um, uh, trying, to, trying to put out the real information uh, to change the negative perceptions of religious Jews and making engaging and meaningful Orthodox Judaism known and accessible. And she's been doing amazing, amazing work for years, and she is continuing. And we're going to talk to her about uh, the backlash and everything she's involved in um, dealing with this current Netflix My Own Orthodox Life show. So let's bring in Allison. Shalom, shalom, Allison. Hi, how are you? Baruch Hashem, thank God, doing well. So, um, before even we, we begin about the My Unorthodox Life, do you want to just give us a little introduction for those who are unfamiliar with your activities of your nonprofit, Jew in the City? Why did you start it? Why is that work so important? Yeah, sure. So, um, I grew up as a proud conservative Jew. Um, which basically meant we judge both the Orthodox and the Reform Jews. So in our mind, Reform didn't do enough, and Orthodox was crazy. But if I'm going to be honest, most of my friends were somewhere between conservative and Reform, so they were still, you know, sort of acceptable in my mind. It was the Orthodox that were really the repugnant group, um, and I really got most of my information about the Orthodox community from media, which captures the crooks, creeps, and extremists of the community. And I never knew anybody normal or balanced or moderate or thoughtful. I really just saw it as this extremist and awful life. And they were an embarrassment to me as a quote unquote normal Jew. Um, when I was eight, a father in my school went crazy and killed both of his kids and himself. And this sort of launched me on this existential crisis where all of the years my parents had spent creating a warm and happy and privileged environment for my sisters and me shattered in a moment because I realized that there were questions about my existence in the universe that I had no wisdom to answer. And this led me on an eight year journey of trying to figure out what the meaning of life was. It was a pretty lonely journey. At the end of eight years, I connected with a modern Orthodox teacher at an after school Hebrew high, and I was expecting him to be a woman subjugating rock throwing extremist. But instead, he was this nice, normal guy living in Teaneck, New Jersey. Um, and he had pretty much as much access to the world as I did um, with more meaning and more wisdom than I had. And I suddenly started to realize maybe I was the one missing things. And so I began a journey to observance. I brought my entire family along with me. So 
My parents, Kanina Hara, have 14 from grandchildren. Ten of them wow. are living in Israel today. Um, wow. And I felt like there was a real, um, there was a real gap between um, sort of the entirety of the Orthodox community and what the media led us on to believe. And so I started off my world, my sort of career in, actually it was not media focused, it was more knowledge focused. The gap between what people knew about orthodoxy and what actually was, as far as I could tell. So I got involved in Jewish outreach. I worked at Partners in Torah and CSY, made some videos for H. But at a certain point I realized that it wasn't just a lack of knowledge, it was media that was sort of preventing nuanced information or positive information getting out there. And I felt like we had to do a worldwide orthodox image makeover campaign at first, I was thinking an anthology or some sort of PR campaign. And in 2005, um, I saw that there was a thing called YouTube that was coming out where you could broadcast yourself and tell your own stories. And I figured if traditional media won't let us tell our own stories, then we could take to this thing called YouTube and tell our own stories there. It was before the word social media or influencer had been invented. I mean, it was years before that. I saw there was a power in information being democratized. And so I hopped on. I quit my job while my husband was in law school, and they told me that if I married an Orthodox, they would subjugate me. But instead, when I said, "Do you mind if we go into credit card debt, take out more student loans, and I'll start something that makes no money and has no business plan," he said, "Go for your dreams." And so that's really how Jew in the City began. Um, first with videos, and then a blog, and then Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Essentially, as more platforms unfolded, um, we got onto those different platforms and started creating a team. Um, I would say sort of our big moments, our big highlights along the way were the Orthodox Jewish All-Star Awards, which started off first as a video with Joe Lieberman, Faye Kellerman, Maccabees, where we didn't want to just show that Orthodox men can be jobs other than rabbis, which is what I believe. We didn't just want to show that Orthodox women are allowed to work, and I believe they couldn't. Um, we wanted to show that they could be the top of their fields, being respected and accommodated in these top organizations and companies, and also the idea that Jewish observance and wisdom could bring meaning to success as opposed to simply take away from it. So we started the All Orthodox Jewish All-Star Awards, which became an uh, almost yearly event. Our last one was in 2019 at Lincoln Center, which was incredible. And then I would say another sort of big point of the organization is our branch called Makom, which is working with the disenfranchised, the people from the already world that had negative experiences that are looking to find a positive connection in orthodoxy. Um, and our latest announcement um, is that we are now three branches. Keter is sort of this media arm to restore the Keter Shem Tov of the from community to both disenfranchise insiders, chizik to insiders, the non-observant, and to combat anti-Semitism. Makom is to help displace Haredi Jews with bad experiences, find a positive connection. And then Tikkun is our newest branch, which is to take the issues that um, we hear from the Mako members, which I came to realize it's not just stereotypes, it's actually some serious issues within a, you know, a large minority is what I would say. Take those issues to uh, leadership, quietly, not to you know, make a big fuss about it, but to really say, what can we do to prevent this pain that's causing people to have such a bad Jewish experience. Wow, that's unbelievable. You're really making an impact on so many levels in so many different areas. So uh, that's, that's fabulous. Keep up the great work. So thank you. You hear about this new Netflix series, My Unorthodox Life. Where did that take you? You heard what it's about. You heard some of the clips. You heard what this lady, Julia Hart, who is the star of this show, she's the reality star of this show, who left her Orthodox lifestyle after herself being a teacher. I understood she was a very charismatic and successful uh, Jewish studies teacher for years. Well, she inspired a lot of girls over her life. I imagine many girls are now questioning, wait a second, she inspired me and look where she is now. What What were the big issues that all of a sudden came to your, came, came, came to your attention that you, all of a sudden you got busy? I mean, I think number one, um, you know, the first thing is that it's the rate at which these types of shows and, t and movies come out. Um, we did not do a scientific analysis, but we did an unscientific analysis, which is that there's been about a dozen uh, TV shows and movies in the last 20 years featuring the ex sort of Jewish genre, the ex Haredi genre compared to five in the Christian world and zero in the Muslim world. Now, if you consider the fact that there are 66 times more Christians in the world than Jews and 34 more times Muslims in the world than Jews, you would expect 
um, the number of ex-Christian and ex-Muslim productions to be just as high. Um, and we made a chart um, on Instagram and Facebook sort of showing how imbalanced the focus on people leaving Judaism is. Um, and so that's sort of the first thing. While I would um, argue that everyone should get to tell their story and that, um, you know, the idea of someone leaving in and of itself does not have to be anti-Semitic. Um, the over-focus, the over-representation of stories of escape um, certainly paints the community as a repugnant and disgusting place that, you know, people only want to leave from. And so that's something that we really have to consider. Why all this focus on our community only as a place of having to leave? That's number one. Number two, um, you know, Within the first five minutes of the show, I got a preview copy, um, you know, as media. Um, Julia Hart lays out, you know, probably 15 of the most difficult or challenging Jewish issues that exist between our text, between, you know, mitzvot, between uh, bad Jewish education with no context, no nuance. She just kind of like drops these bombs one at a time. And so even before the show came out, we had prepared sort of a list of how to respond to these, you know, different Jewish issues that are raised. Because at the end of the day, um, some things that she said about her life were flat out lies. Like the fact that she said that uh, she never had a radio or a newspaper. Um, her husband graduated from Wharton. Um, you know, he's the CEO of a tech company. Her students from Atlanta told me that she wouldn't be caught dead without a copy of Vogue magazine. Um, she certainly painted someone's life. There are certainly some, um, you know, Haredi Jew out there that doesn't have a radio or newspaper, but that's not her. And so as a reliable storyteller, um, it becomes very complicated because she just sort of um, wow. quickly shows that she's not to be trusted in that way. Um, although um, it does beg the question then, and this is what we dug into, you know, what about the people that have no access to the larger world? If they're choosing to not have access, then that can be a self-actualized choice. If there's someone that would like more access and is not allowed to have it, that becomes problematic. Um, but yes, yeah, she sort of unloaded lots of you know challenging mitzvahs and you know Tommy tech that did need to be dug into, and so we put out an article. What we know from the last time Unorthodox came out, the original Unorthodox, and I was interviewed on a TV show and the anchor had to specify, I don't mean this Unorthodox, I mean that Unorthodox. If it's getting so difficult to be able to clarify which Unorthodox you're talking about, it could be that maybe there's too many of these shows happening. With the last Unorthodox that came out last March, the pandemic had just started, I thought, well, what work do we have um, as a nonprofit when everyone is gonna just try to not die from coronavirus? Maybe we don't even have a purpose anymore. Then two weeks into it, Unorthodox came out. And in the two months that followed, we got more traffic than we had gotten in all of 2019. So, wow. you know, uh, we see that we are a resource that people on the internet go. That's savvy people. Savvy people will go to the internet and look into more information. Um, I would say most of the viewing public is not so savvy. I can tell you when I saw Orthodox content on TV, I did not question it. I did not, you know, sort of dig in to try to understand is this everyone? Um, and what I'll tell you is that even a good friend of mine who's a reformed Jew who saw me take this journey in high school from conservative to Orthodox, um, she was watching Shtisel and she's like, it's a great show. I said, I agree, but it's like, it's a little extreme. It's kind of like showing the most extreme part of the Jewish world. And she says to me, oh, that's kind of funny coming from you. And I said, because you think I'm like Shissel? And she's like, yeah. And so the fact that she's been to my home and sees the way that we dress, the you know media that we consume, the way that we travel, the education that you know we have, the fact that she could see that and basically lump us into Shtisel is because I understand this, the laziness that people do. We all do it. Uh, we're not all of us. There are the savvy and savviest among us, but many of us just sort of, are spoon fed what media feeds us and don't have the ability to sort of critically think beyond that. I was invited to a YouTube minority creator event and I heard um, a black YouTube creator talking about how sick she is of like the sassy black woman that is in every sitcom. And as she mentioned it, I was like, oh, I've seen that character here, 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 here. Now, the truth is that because it's not my community, I had never thought about the fact that that's sort of an offensive portrayal to just always show the black woman as a, mm, mm, mm. But like when I heard her say that, I was like, wow, like I hear what you're saying. I hear your truth. I feel the same right. way about my community and it's frustrating. And what I would say is that we're waking up now to this reality that like minorities don't want to be stereotypes anymore. And that's a wonderful thing. And it seems to be happening in every other community except for the Jewish community. And that's really what I would say is the most challenging thing here. The world is waking up 
to this bad content creation and trying to do better, except the Jews are not being invited to that party. Well, well, yeah. Can you expand upon that? Why are you saying that it's every other minority community is interested in changing the stereotypes, but not the Jewish community? Are you the only one really out there now trying to make a difference? Meaning everyone else is just no. silent and not bothered by this 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 trend? No, no. It's not that we don't care. We very much care. If you took to social media in the last week, you saw that people very much care. What the issue is that I don't think Hollywood cares. And I think it comes down to, unfortunately, intersectionality. Whoever created the intersectionality concept, I believe it was not a mistake that they left Jews out of it. We don't neatly fit into any box. Um, the way that we are hated and oppressed in you know, sort of every generation doesn't fit neatly into the narrative of intersectionality. And because of that, because not enough of us have brown skin, because not enough of us are poor, um, because you know, the Holocaust was 70 years ago, there are people that believe that we are just you know, basically white um, and we have all the privilege. Um, and that we don't need any special care. And I'll tell you what annoys me. I don't go to shul so often. Um, not because I'm not allowed to, but because I choose not to. But I did go this past Shabbos. Um, and it, there were three security guards, including you know a volunteer. Three security guards and a locked door at the front of my shul with a code that wow. I could not remember. Um, before I could get inside. And I thought to myself, and we're not a protected minority. Like, what? so what the heck is it? We both have to live under lock and key and fear of sending our kids to schools and going to kosher stores because we know these places were targeted. And yet we, we are gaslit that we actually have a problem. And I got into an interesting conversation with um, a non-Jewish black man um, after the Jersey City shooting and the Muncie stabbing because we did this neat program under our Ketra branch called Meet a Jew in the City, Make a Friend. We went to Harlem. We opened up a tent almost like Avraham Avinu. And we basically oh, you did a video. Yeah, we we put it out there. Life. Yeah. Yeah, so we did that back when you could, like, you know, hand food to strangers and people uh, weren't afraid of you uh, infecting them. I mean, it was sort of a very exciting thing that overnight sort of started to become this grassroots movement and then the pandemic just shut it all down. I obviously would love to get back to that, but um, it led to an interesting conversation with a man that lives in Harlem and he said to me, I don't get what your oppression is. Could you explain it? He said, it seems like Jews are doing pretty well. And I said, a lot of us are, thank God. But really what, um, what makes us feel endangered as Jews is that we always know that our success is not lasting. And um, I actually wrote an article after that to be able to kind of quantify or put it into words, which is one of our most shared articles, probably got shared about 12,000 times to date, um, on sort of the talk that Jewish parents have with their children. We're familiar with the talk that black parents have with their children. That's spoken about a lot. And I think it's important that we understand different minority experiences so we can be more compassionate and more understanding and find ways to make them feel included and safer. But what has never been uh, explained uh, to my knowledge because I haven't seen it anywhere else and a lot of people wanted to share this was the fact that Jewish parents have a talk with their children and it goes something like this we are hated people we've always been a hated people um, things are good right now but things were good in the past and one day things may turn and we may need to run for our lives and what I said in the article is that in case you don't believe me that this is a talk that most Jews have with their parents open up the Yagata the Haggadah is actually where we tell the story of the Jewish people. Not only the whole do door about door on Abraham, Abraham, you know, right. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So we talk about the Hisha Amda in every generation. Our enemies will rise up uh, to, you know, to destroy us. We also talk about Abraham being, you know, othered that he's, you know, Aver. And that's where Ivory comes from that like literally is built into the name of the Jews are an othered people. But if you didn't have parents that could explain that to you, they would at least tell you the Hisha Amda. And so this is a talk that is said at the um, the Seder, which you know over 90% of Jews participate in a Seder at some point in their lives. Um, and it's a conversation that parents have explicitly with children about, we have our passports ready. Um, Orthodox people that were raised Orthodox have conversations like, you're noticeably Jewish. And so you do X, Y, Z if something dangerous happens. You know, that wasn't something we had to worry about as more secular Jews because we weren't sort of wearing our Judaism on our sleeve. Um, and so I think that's really what we need to push back out now. The fact that there is um, a danger in being a Jew, that there is a fear and an oppression and we don't fit neatly into the boxes. But um, there is something, we are an actual minority. You know, there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. There's 15 million Jews. We are actually a minority. And even if we have, um, you know, we've worked hard, achieved some success 
right now, we are all essentially raised with this idea that it is not necessarily lasting. It always eventually gets ripped away from us. And so that's a really, um, that's a heavy way to live. And people need to understand what that experience is like. And just because there's a lot of Jewish executives in Hollywood who maybe aren't kind of thinking about their owning up, that doesn't mean that that shouldn't be part of the conversation and that Orthodox Jews can continue to be vilified over and over again. It doesn't mean that we don't have complicated issues within our community. It doesn't mean that we don't have texts or laws that are sort of weighty and need to be grappled with. We can have a nuanced conversation, but just right. sort of the simplicity of it um, and just the, the cheap attacks, um, it's not fair. Right. No, you raise a very, very good point because it shows what's going on, what we're experiencing, and that's been growing and developing over the past years um it's way beyond specific complaints about about the, the jewish people or, or or orthodox judaism or our way of life it and and it i'll, I'll go even for I'll, I'll build upon what you're saying because when you said yeah the jewish people have been has been specifically let outside of the fence of this whole intersectional uh ideology and I, I agree or disagree with me. I think the problem is also within our own communities, our own children. You're talking about the conversation we're supposed to have and that we do have at the Pesach table, at the Passover table, but yet not many Jews are actually internalizing that, even though we say it every year. And you have a whole generation, if not two or even three, even of our own generation, um, who have accepted and believe, yeah, we're privileged. Not, not, yeah, not so you. I'll, I'll no, we're thinking... Yeah, I was just going to add, saying, well, wait all, a second, we're, like you were saying, we're a minority, we're the Jewish people, we're not white, we're not black, we're not brown, we're not yellow, we're, we're, we're different than everyone else, we're Jews, right, we're Jews from, from our ancestral homeland, Judea, we're a nation, we don't go by our color, we're all colors, and uh, we're different, we're not privileged white, not that there's anything wrong with being privileged, there's nothing wrong with being white, but, we're, but too many Jews have been br brought in to believe that, right yeah, well. we are privileged, we are white, and therefore, they don't stand up against the stereotyping against us or against the growing anti-Semitism against us because they have this guilt complex. All right. So number one, um, when I wrote this article about um, the talk that Jewish parents have with their children, I heard from Jews who said, actually, my parents took that part, the Hisha Amda, out of the Seder because it was too uncomfortable. So it's like, okay, so you don't actually know your history anymore. And if wow. you don't know your history, you don't know your future. So that was the first thing that I found out was sort of truly disturbing. The second thing that came out from this, which I've also written about, when we did that pop-up in Harlem, um, we met a black woman there who saw, we brought a Hasidic Jew along, um, a woman in a spitzel and a turban. And she, the black woman said to the Hasidic woman, when I look at you, I think that you're in real estate. And the Hasidic woman was like, I don't even own anything. I just rent my apartment. Um, and then I interjected and I said, you know, just like the black community doesn't want to be judged for, you know, by their skin color. So too, the Orthodox community doesn't want to be judged by how we look. And then she jumped in and she said, well, it's a little bit different because you could just stop dressing like this if you chose to. To which I said, you're right. And so if we had to pass through a field where they were going to kill blacks and Jews, we would be at the advantage or some sort of, you know, uh, we had to get out of the country and go through a car and there was a, you know, a checkpoint. We would be at the advantage. We could go into hiding and you could not. And that is certainly a real difference. But the thing is that we don't want to remove our Jewish dress and we don't want to stop visiting our synagogues or our kosher stores or our yeshivas. Essentially, I started thinking about merit of the Jews in Egypt that kept their names and their dress and their language, it is in the act of insisting on being outwardly Jewish and practicing Judaism that we retain our Judaism. And yet there is this pushback, really almost victim blaming, that once I started putting these ideas out online, I heard things like, well, he could have just put on a uh, baseball cap. Well, he could have just cut off his payas. And there's this sick idea that, well, you did choose to look so outwardly Jewish. So you didn't have to, which is really, um, again, in the age of uh, inclusivity and diversity is such a sick um, and just yep. wrong perspective. And we need to know that this is out there and we need to push back at it. No, 100%. I mean, just to throw in a personal anecdote, I mean, I've been to Europe just a number of times over the past few years, obviously not over the past year and a half. And every time I go, I, part of my Jewish identity is is 
outwardly being proud to be seen as a Jew. Whether someone likes me or not, I don't want to hide my identity. I'm proud of being Jewish. I want to walk through the streets of Paris with my, with my head covering, right, with my yarmulke. In the end, I didn't because my wife was afraid, because uh, things were dangerous there, and I wore a hat. But in general, wherever in, I am in the world, I do want to be able to be proud of my identity and not have to hide it. And it's sad, like you mentioned, that people just, oh, just hide your identity. No, 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 no. It's a pride. Do you, w- would you want to give, give, stop wearing things that you're proud about, your own identity? That, that, that is, that is the, totally the wrong approach. Um, and yet, as you're noting, that is the approach many people are saying today, which is, uh, which is really so sad. Um, so I want, I want to take you on a different angle for a second. Because it's been inspiring to see the pushback online, specifically against uh, 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 in response to this My Unorthodox Life, a reality show on Netflix, the pushback from Orthodox women. Many Orthodox women pushing out their own stories as a contra, saying, hey, everyone, don't believe, yeah, that's Julia Hart's own personal story, and that's her story, and that's fine. But do not believe those stereotypes that are being brought across from the show. Look at all of these other My Orthodox Life stories of Jewish women. Can you give us any insight or your thoughts in terms of that pushback campaign? Yeah, sure. So um, certainly within the Orthodox world, um, this campaign has picked up. I think, you know, it, it certainly creates chizuk for the community itself. The question is, does anyone outside of our community see it? Um, and that's, you know, really what we've been trying to build for all of these years, first to create, you know, a movement within the Orthodox community and then be seen by the larger world and then possibly take that narrative um, and that cause even to uh, mainstream media. Um, I, look, I, looking at it, it's very familiar. We've been telling those stories at Jew in the City since 2007, since our founding, um, because social media does give us the power to tell stories in our own words not to negate the fact that there are issues and that people experience orthodoxy differently, but the fact that um, there's a broader story to tell and the fact that there's such a refusal to tell it. I mean, it seems pretty telling. There's a YouTuber named Peter Santanello who I got to interview, who's a wonderful guy who likes to sort of interview the underdog and tell the stories that nobody wants to tell. And the fascinating thing is that we always hear, oh, well, Hollywood and tell the positive stories because there's nothing sort of interesting about that. And yet Peter's, um, you know, videos about Orthodox and Haredi and Hasidic Jews have gotten millions of views because I would argue that there's actually something that is very compelling to see a group that you just thought, you know, women that were all, uh, you know, chained to their stove, popping out babies indiscriminately to see them talk about how empowered they feel um, is actually a really interesting, compelling story. And so I think that the um, appetite is there. Um, And certainly it's nice to see, you know, women coming out and doing this. The question is, um, will it go beyond our circles? You know, I've seen a little bit of reporting in Jewish media to get, I think what I find challenging is that Netflix is out to sort of a a large secular non-Jewish audience. And then all the reporting from Julia Hart's perspective is large secular non-Jewish audience. Um, The question is, will any of this Jewish content from the Orthodox perspective get out to there? And I'll tell you, I wrote an op-ed for the JTA. Um, I had pitched it first to some larger secular platforms. They didn't want it. And so that's a little bit of the challenge, I would say, that we can talk amongst ourselves, maybe even outside of the Orthodox world to the Jewish world at large. Um, But what about the Jews that don't read Jewish outlets? And what about the non-Jewish world? Is there a chance for us to be able to tell our story in our own words? You know, one of the things that I discovered also is that um, for a lot of movies and TV shows with Hasidic characters, even if they're not ex-Hasidic, but simply Hasidic, um, Hollywood uses ex-Hasidic Jews as their consultants, which um, I find to be outrageous and um, just wrong because uh, you would never go to an ex-Democrat um, who is now you know, a card-carrying and proud Republican to get information on the Democratic Party because obviously he had an issue with it. He, you know, left it, he didn't like it. And so he has now defected and gone on to the other side. Um, A reporter or, you know, um, producer would never go to the ex-Democrat to report on the Democratic Party because his perspective obviously has a certain slant to it. Maybe he's a voice to bring into the conversation, 
you talk to the insiders and then you speak to the person that left as sort of an another point of view but to have the person that defected as your main consultant or expert on the community is obviously a slanted perspective and yet that's what tv show producers and directors are doing again and again and so um i think really what needs to happen is a pushback that goes beyond um you know just uh the orthodox circles or the jewish circles we need to find a way to get this message out to the same platforms that are you know showing this show and talking about the show we need to be able to have a voice there and that's what we're working on now with you in the city and I, I just want to throw in an anecdote that many people are unfamiliar with and i think our generation will be at least familiar with the television show remember law and order the original yeah. law, the original Law and Order. One of the main characters, his name, I think he was the Attorney General in the Stephen show, Hill. Adam Schill, Adam Schiff, right, was his stage name, yeah. right, in the show, and yeah. his, his his real name was Stephen Hill, and no one had any clue, but he was an Orthodox Jew, um, and yeah. part of his personal story is he actually gave he actually gave up many many fabulous. Uh, star-studded roles in Hollywood and on television because they wouldn't allow him to be religious in his lifestyle during the during the recordings, and he was very much tr true to his Jewish identity as an Orthodox Jew, um, and he ended up being successful even though he missed out all the opportunities of being stars in all these movies and television shows. And uh, it, it's important for people to know there are success stories out there as well, even though. They don't. They don't get the attention um, because he's not an actor to be to, to to be religious on the screen. He's an actor. He just happens to be religious. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think something that um, maybe the larger Jewish community and non-Jewish world needs to recognize is that although Jews have been having success for decades now in America, and there was a time that we couldn't, you know, belong to country clubs or you know colleges, and we had to make our own. And there was a time even before that when we couldn't vote or couldn't own land. I mean, that is how the country was started, even after 1776, which I found out. Because that's kind of all it gets erased or forgotten about, that we actually started off without the same status as, you know, white Christian males. We had a separate status as Jews. But even though sort of the larger Jewish community has had successes for decades now, as an Orthodox community, we're still having first. We just had Jacob Steinmetz, the first Orthodox Jew to be drafted to the major leagues, you know, for baseball. Right. Um, we still have first of, you know, um, you know, actors. You know, Stephen Hill was the first Orthodox actor. You know, Maya Bialik, my friend, you know, I was is the first female modern Orthodox actress, um, and she still faces a lot of challenges to be able to. Um, you know, observe her her Orthodox uh, Jewish practices within the confines of Hollywood. There are accommodations for every other group. Beatty Deutsch, um, marathon mom, you know, was qualified for the Olympic time for the last Olympics, was working to qualify for the Tokyos and miss it by about a minute and a half, but they were not willing to accommodate Shabbos. So here you have um, the Olympic Committee that accommodated Muslims fasting on Ramadan, you know, has accommodations for transgender athletes. There's all these different areas now where, you know, the world's trying to figure out how do we include people from sort of unusual backgrounds or different, you know, backgrounds to fit in. And yet time and time again, the Orthodox Jew is left behind. And the answer sort of is like, sorry, we don't have space for you here. And this is really something I would say it's all really the same issue. Like, can we, can we practice um, and not be judged? Must we all be lumped together as fundamentalists? I would say that's probably, you know, besides um, the exaggerations or just flat out lies that happen in my unorthodox life, besides, um, you know, sort of unloading some of the most difficult issues in our texts and laws, you know, in the first five minutes with no context or nuance, I would say one of my biggest complaints is just sort of like referring to Haredi over and over again as fundamentalist, fundamentalist, fundamentalist. When in reality, of course, there's fundamentalists within that population, and that needs to be dealt with. We need to, every moderate out there needs to keep their fundamentalists in check to make sure that they don't have power positions and leadership positions, because fundamentalists will do crazy unhealthy things to the, you know, their constituents. Um, but I think, you know, 
can we be represented in a way that we're not shown as revolting? Um, and, you know, can we be accommodated? Can you make accommodations for our lifestyle too? Can we have a seat at the table um, to be able to tell our own stories? Can we have a seat at the table to, for you to be able to work around our Sabbath and, you know, holiday observances? Like, can in a world of more um, interest in equality and inclusion, can we be invited to the table too? And, you know, that's, I would say the heart of, you know, what we've been doing since 2007 and what we'll continue to, to keep doing. Yeah, and all the power to you, and all the amazing work you're doing. And I guess, the, listen, you raised so many important points, so many important points. One of, one of, one of my fears, though, is because as you touched upon so eloquently, like the, the major problem for, for the Jews today in, uh, in Western society is this growth of this progressive uh, intersectionality agenda that's overtaking, not just overtaking the media, overtaking corporate America and in so many aspects of our lives. Even Jewish organizations are being overtaken and, Jew and Jewish schools, even Orthodox schools are being overtaken by this wave of progressive intersectionality you know, ideology, uh, even within our own walls. And it, it, ha I, I'm, I'm just afraid we're not going to be able to overcome that because it, it, in order for us to get a seat at the table properly, it means that the other side has to recognize that their ideological agenda of intersectionality is flawed. And that is a whole so, world yes. view that's, over, that's overcoming all of our lives in so many ways. Uh, I'm not taking away from the importance of all the, all the work you're doing. Of 100%, we do it and we make a difference everywhere we can. I'm just so, uh, um, my fear is that on the, on the macro level, um, it's more about helping Jews be strong and living with this new reality as opposed to succeeding and changing the outside world here and there. Hopefully we'll, we will make changes, but it just looks like the trajectory is, is so scary. The direction things are going. So this is what I think. I think the way that sort of human history goes is that, you know, sort of the pendulum swings to extremes and then the Shvil Azahav, the golden mean, is eventually reached. And I think um, sort of some of the most progressive ideas have gone to the extreme. But the question is, is there some piece of that about sort of more inclusivity and more equality that um, comes with more of a moderate take that we can take from that? And that's, I guess, what my hope is. I think the swing all the way to the left is actually pushing out a lot of classic liberals. Barry Weiss is one of them. So I think that there are people that are feeling displaced because things have gone so extreme. And it's my hope and my belief that things will come down. There will be a way to capture sort of the best ideas of, you know, some of the this push um, of intersectionality with um, not being, I think the problem with the doctrine, it, it is so rigid. It doesn't allow, again, room for the Jews. And I think we could just give up and say, well, you know, there's nothing left to do. And, you know, in terms of our tikkun branch, fighting systemic issues within some of the most insular and extreme parts of the Orthodox world, people have said to us, like, that's crazy. Or even changing the perception of Orthodox Jews, that's crazy. What I guess I would say is that, like, lo alecha ham lechalik more. You know, like, you know, it's not up to us to finish the job, but we're also not allowed to um, not get started either. And so I think we have to, you know, make our best effort and put forward cogent arguments. And the more that I do this, and the more that, you know, we sort of understand what the other side's argument is, the more we can show the, the faultiness in um, their logic. Um, and we just keep on repeating it. But I think, uh, in a way, this um, sort of awakening of more inclusivity to all minorities, we now need to go to, you know, get to those tables and say, we expect the same treatment for our community as well. Um, we, we won't stand for different treatment, you know, telling, you know, um, Lynn manuel uh, Miranda just made this movie, um, The Heights, about, um, you know, the Latina community in The Heights, and there were uh, browner uh, Hispanics that felt like they were not being represented, and so they put back, and, you know, he 
apologize and said that he's going to do more work. Like there are these nuanced conversations where you could have a movie of great representation of a minority group, but then a group within the group said, hey, we weren't represented. You need to do better. I mean, that's essentially what we're saying in these, you know, sort of unorthodox films. Okay, so you're representing a piece of the orthodox experience, but how about our representation? And so if it's not too much for the, you know, African Hispanics to say, hey, we want more representation. Why do you leave us out? We should be able to say the same thing and we should be able to say, here's an example when another group did it. Um, and I, that's my feeling. We're just going to keep on um, repeating this and keep on looking for more ways to climb up and get the message out to, you know, bigger audiences, higher up the chain. Um, and obviously we'll, we'll need, you know, Hashem's help to do that. All the things that, you know, if you need Siyat Deshmaya, you need the right connections, the right time, the right place. Um, but you have to be in the game to have success in it. No, listen, fabulous answer. I love your optimism. And I'm already going to say it right now. I know you're going to be successful. I know you're going to make a difference, right? Just the fact that you're in the game, as you said, and you will, and you will make a difference here and there, here and there. And, um, and for sure, the biggest winners will be those Jews who will be touched by your message or touched because of whatever changes you were able to, to, to bring about that they will be either safer or stronger in their own Jewish identity and understandings of their own identity. Um, so yeah, listen, Allison, you're doing amazing work. You are a powerhouse and, uh, it is a pleasure to be able to, to say that, uh, that I know you and, uh, been following your work and a Kaddish Baruch the one above continue giving you the strength and the wisdom to continue doing what you're doing and making the little and big differences that you are. So thank you. I mean, thank you so much. A pleasure. All right. Good luck to you, uh, Allison. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, everybody. There you go. Allison Josephs of, of the nonprofit organization Jew in the City. Uh, plenty of work to be done. You heard the multi-layers, the multi-layers of challenges out there, That especially this Netflix series that I don't necessarily advise anyone to watch because it sounds just like a series that was developed in order to bash Orthodox Judaism. I personally don't have Netflix and I hardly watch any shows, hardly have any time to watch any shows out there, but everyone should know about the, uh, about this show and uh, the unfortunate huge negative impact this show is having. And it is wonderful knowing I, I know I can go to sleep easier at night knowing that we have someone like Allison Josephs and the amazing work that she's doing with her organization and everyone who works with her uh, to to stand up for uh, for the true information uh, in order for not just for the Orthodox Jewish community or the Jewish community to move forward in a, in, in a better way, but also that the outside world moves forward together with the Orthodox community, Orthodox Jewish community and Jewish community to a better future altogether. Signing off for another episode of the Pulse of Israel here in our eternal and ancestral homeland. This is Avi Abelow for another episode of the Pulse of Israel. Thanks for watching, everyone. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.